Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another amazing session of the Dallas ISD MWBE Black History Month Facebook Live series. I am Stephanie Broch, and I'll be one of your moderators for this afternoon session. This afternoon session is I mean, going to be so amazing. We are going to be featuring our MWBE leaders, and we cannot wait for you guys to hear their stories and for them to share a little bit more about themselves. But before we get started, I want to go ahead and share with you the Dallas ISD video. Black History Month is a month dedicated to commemorating the achievements of Black people throughout history and is a very important event for all of America to celebrate. Today, Black History Month is celebrated not only in the United States, but around the globe by five different countries. Black History Month is celebrated to honor Black contributions to the arts, culture, science, sports, and history. It is also a time to reflect on the progress, the richness, and the diversity of African-American achievements. Please join us as we recognize and celebrate the contributions of Black Americans in our nation, our state, and our local communities. We encourage everyone to visit our Black History Month district-wide website for scheduled events. Join us as we celebrate this year's theme, Black Resilience. Let's celebrate the vital role that African Americans have played in the development and progress of America throughout our history. Awesome. Again, don't hesitate to take a look at the website to learn more about Dallas ISD's Black History Month events and additional information about this amazing month. So as I said, we're going to be talking with our MWBE leaders today. And to get us started, I'd like to introduce you guys to Vernon Mullen. He is going to be the moderator for one of our sessions this afternoon. Vernon is an MWBE compliance manager with Jacobs, which is part of the MWBE bond construction department. So Vernon, Thank you very much, <clears throat> Stephanie. <clears throat> it's truly an honor and a privilege to present two of our distinguished leaders <clears throat> of the Dallas Independent School District as we celebrate back Black History Month in the district. These leaders play a critical role in advancing opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. Vernon, you somehow got muted. It is, <clears throat> it's truly an honor and a privilege uh, to present two of our distinguished leaders of the Dallas Independent School District as we celebrate Black History Month in the district. These leaders play a critical role in advancing opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses in Dallas and throughout the state of Texas, especially in the Northern region. Let me introduce our first presenter. Uh, he is Mr. Leslie Williams, Deputy Chief of the Minority and Women Business Enterprise Special Projects, MWBE. Welcome, Mr. Williams. Tell us about yourself. Are you a native of Dallas? Uh, share your journey with us, your parents, your siblings, your children. Talk about yourself so we can get to know you better. Thank you, Mr. Mullins, and thank you, uh, Ms. Broughton, for this opportunity. <laughs> uh, again, my name is Leslie Williams. I was born and raised here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I attended uh, elementary, middle, and high school in, uh, at, in Dallas ISD. I graduated from South Oak Cliff High School, and from there, I attended Prairie View A&M University, where I received my uh, bachelor's degree and went back to get my uh, master's degree from Prairie View also in administration and supervision. And uh, from that, I received my mid-management mm -hmm. certification at uh, 
TWU. Again, and uh, I, uh, I'm married. I have uh, uh, three children, uh, two daughters and a son, and I have a uh, lovely young 11 year old granddaughter. That's great. We're gonna we'll ask uh, some uh, more specific questions about the family members in a little bit. Uh, tell us what it was like attending Dallas schools. Take us back to those days. Very interesting. Um, it was a, it was a great experience for me and uh, and the students who attended school back then. Uh, we had teachers who well, when I first started school, we still had segregation in Dallas. And so, therefore, in uh, the elementary years, I had to attend a, uh, well, just uh, a, a black school, elementary school. Uh, we were not allowed, even though I lived in a neighborhood that was predominantly white, uh, we had to go across town to attend school because I was not allowed to attend. Back then, it was R.L. Thorne Elementary School. Uh, I had to... Uh, go all the way across town to back then what they called Alva Sidney Johnson uh, Elementary School. But that, that was just the case. And then uh, after the sixth grade, you know, integration, and uh, I finally got a chance to go to uh, my neighborhood school. So I went from there to Service and Walk, uh, junior high school then, and uh, South Oak Cliff. But, it, but the one thing about it is that we had teachers who were really committed to us. Uh, they understood basically what we were going, to, what we would face once we graduated from school, and they worked extremely hard to make sure that we were prepared to become productive members of society. Did uh, did you participate in sports when you were in school in DISD? Yes, I did. I tell, uh, us, about, tell us about those accomplishments on and off the field. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I played um, in junior high and high school. I played football. And, and I ran track uh, for, at, well, at Sarazone Wall and at South Oak Club High School. Uh, have things changed since your days in, the, in Dallas schools? Yes, yes, they really have. Uh, I, I really think that we've made a lot of progress. I don't think that the district has, receives the credit that it should. And it takes someone like me who's been around for over 40 years and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and I see so much progress, especially when it comes to professional development for teachers to build the capacity of our teachers. We have a lot of young teachers in the district now, not only in Dallas, but throughout the country. And so the district has a, a strong professional development program, and we partner with the uh, regional service center, uh, Region 10, where we have additional training uh, for our teachers. In addition to that, we have something in, in the district that I wish we'd had when I was a, a classroom teacher. We have what we call a PLC period, which is a professional, uh, professional learning community uh, period where teachers come together and they're able, they're able to collaborate as they develop their lesson plans. Uh, you know, basically the district can offer professional development during that period of time. But it is, it's a great thing, whereas you have your experienced teachers, like for example, in mathematics, uh, are in, sitting down in the same room with the first year teachers, and they're sharing best practices and strategies, which is excellent. And uh, another thing that's uh, exceptional that I'm, I'm really excited about is the choice schools. Uh, whereas, you know, back when I was in school, you just had to attend the school that in your neighborhood, you didn't have a choice. But now our students have a choice. They can go to, they can apply for the magnet schools, Montessori schools, uh, early college and the P-TECH program. I mean, it's known, it's amazing. People all over the, the country know about Dallas ISD's early college and P-TECH program. And, and uh, when I attend conferences in Chicago or, or Florida and different places, but everyone is wanting to know, you know, we heard so many things about Dallas ISD and the, the uh, different programs that you all have in place and initiatives. And, uh, you know, we're superstars in other states or whatever. And so therefore, it's just those choices, uh, the International Baccalaureate Program. I can go on and on. And then lately, we have our career institutes. 
that are opening now. And we have Career Institutes, uh, Career Institute North, South, and East that are open now. And, and that's another area that I just really get excited about when these kids can learn about architecture, uh, aviation, uh, cyber security, uh, gamer design sports, which is going to be worth a, a lot in the future, uh, interior design, whatever those students want, you know, and, and we've come to the realization that we want our students to attend college, but some of our students choose not to attend college. So therefore, these students are able to get uh, certifications, industry certifications, uh, uh, they're also able to get, to get internships through these career institutes. And there are a lot of companies that are just chopping at the bits to hire them because of uh, the fact that they've gone, they've attended the career institutes and they have the uh, internships and industry certification. That is really exciting. I got to visit one of those career institutes uh, not long ago, and it really is exciting to see the uh, the array of opportunities that are available for students, for those who, who want to go to college and those who maybe feel that they want to go the technical route and not, and not attend college. That is really exciting. Who comes to mind when you think of African-Americans that have impacted your life? Uh, who, the people who have impacted my life? Yes. Uh, it's basically my teachers, the, uh, you know, my, the principal is my number one uh, I mean, just these three, you had basically what you have now is three men that really uh, work with me. Uh, Dr. Frederick Ty Sr. and Judge uh, Lewis Bedford Jr. And uh, I told Friday, these are three older guys who really took time to sit down and mentor me, uh, talk to me about, you know, get, making good decisions and making suggestions and recommendations for me, uh, period. Uh, they knew basically my father passed in a car wreck back when I was real young. And so uh, I was attending uh, Zumwalt, Sarah Zumwalt at that time. And Dr. Frederick Todd just kind of put me under his wing uh, and uh, worked with me, kept me straight, made sure that I didn't get into any trouble. And if so, he had a way of uh, getting my attention uh, to say that. And uh, but uh, Judge Belford and Mr. Friday, you know, were, were major had a major impact on me. And I always looked up to them because, you know, they were very, very successful and popular young uh, men in Dallas, I speak. And what well, the Dallas period. Yeah, we've heard of each of these individuals and the work that they've done that made significant contributions to uh, to Dallas and to the uh, the education system and also the uh, the social system in Dallas. We've really come forward th thanks to the uh, the work that each of these individuals have done. Uh, there was a photo earlier that of you and uh, members of your staff were these were these teachers that uh, that worked with you in the in the school system. Yes, that was a, a photo of uh, me and my staff over at Carter High School. Uh, we were celebrating because we had been awarded a recognized status uh, based on the state testing for two consecutive years over at Carter High School, and we were celebrating that. Uh, you know, so that that was we were one of the first. Uh, we were the first uh, predominantly African American school to receive that recognized status based on test scores, state assessments uh, in the history of Dallas ISD. So we were really proud about that. You you look like you were about twenty five years old in that photo. <laughs> oh yeah, I was a little younger than this. <laughs> Now talk about <clears throat> talk about the individuals behind you. Do you recall them by name? And what uh, were they roles? What were they roles in school? Uh, basically, it was teachers and, and counselors. Uh, and, and basically, they worked with South Oak Club High School, supporting us in the total program. Now, have have those individuals? Oh gosh, that's a, that's exciting. Tell us about that photo. What are you doing there? That's when I was a principal at Martin Weiss Elementary School. You know, Ben and I was the first one at elementary, middle, and high school in my career. But I was, uh, that was one day that I, was going, I went into a classroom and, and I, you know, I used to enjoy going into the classroom and not really taking over, but uh, I would like to get involved and get engaged, et cetera. 
with the uh, instructions. So that's one thing I was doing with a group of young people. Well, that seems like something that you really enjoyed. Yeah, I love going into classrooms, uh, uh, working with the young people. It's, it's, I'm, I've always just been amazed. We have so many brilliant young people in our schools, and uh, they just don't receive a lot of uh, uh, attention or acclaim or uh, whatever. They're not highlighted often. You only hear a lot of time about some of the students who might make mistakes. But we have so many brilliant young kids in Dallas ISD. And I understand you're continuing to go into the schools now, aren't you? Yes, yes. Basically, I'm, I'm working. To, uh, basically, I'm uh, working as a, an executive coach at one of our, our high schools, also. So just working with, they've uh, been a mentor to one of our principals, and uh, get a chance to go back into the classrooms, to the uh, PLC meetings with the teachers, etc. Which is something that I like doing. You played a role in getting African-American studies courses taught in the state of Texas through the State Board of Education. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, that was a, a major accomplishment, something that I'm really proud of. Uh, that's basically when I was working with the Racial Equity Office in Dallas ISD, you know, and Dr. Hosa assigned me uh, to lead, gave me the assignment of leading the the first racial equity office in Dallas, in Dallas. and uh, that was one of the uh, major goals. Was to we had found out that the this uh, Mexican American Studies course had been approved by the State Board of Education uh, two years prior, but there was not an approval by the uh, State Board of Education for an African for a African American Studies uh, uh, course. So therefore, what we did. We uh, got with some a uh, Dr. Marvin Delaney, uh, one of the well-known professors at UT Arlington, who's well known when it comes to uh, African history, et cetera, or African studies. Uh, got with him and some others to help us write uh, the curriculum for an African American studies course. And and the one thing that we did, I wanted to be you know consistent. You know, we didn't, the district did not have uh, the curriculum even for the Mexican American Studies course. So therefore, we hired teachers to help us develop the curriculum for the Mexican American Studies course and the African American Studies course. And we presented that to the State Board of Education. We took a group of students uh, who were taking the courses and two down to Austin. We, I know, forget. You know, to get high school students to get up early in the morning, be on a bus by 5.30 to travel down to Austin and let you know that they were really committed. They really wanted the State Board of Education to approve this course. So I went in, we went to, uh, to the meeting and uh, we, we were really blessed. Uh, we presented our case to them. Uh, we had our, our school board trustee, Dr. George Foreman was there with us. Uh, we had Senator Royce West came, and, and it was amazing. We had representatives from Houston, San Antonio, and Austin had heard that we were going to do that. And so they wanted basically the courses in those cities too. But anyway, so we presented, and we had our students to talk to the board members, and, and we were really blessed. We uh, 17 members of the state board. We received 17 zero votes in favor of the African American <laughs> Studies course. And uh, we were really excited about that. And so that basically gave every high school in the state of Texas an opportunity to teach the African American Studies course, which they had already approved the one for the Mexican American Studies course. Wow, what a what an accomplishment with the, with the results of the, vo the votes. I don't know that we get those kind of uh, unanimous votes these days, but that was quite an accomplishment. You mentioned earlier that you attended Prairie View a &M University, an HBCU, a historically right. black university college. Why Prairie View a &M when you probably could have gone any uh, any other place you chose? Why well, Prairie View? You, you know, if you notice Dallas ISD, you have a, back then when I was teaching, there a lot of staff members, the administrators, like Dr. Todd, uh, Judge Bedford, uh, 
I don't try to all of them attended Prairie View A&M University. We had a lot of executives and teachers uh, that had attended uh, Prairie View A&M, A&M University. And uh, my uh, one of my football coaches at South Oak Cliff uh, kind of talked to me about going to Prairie View and uh, Mr. Charlie Malone and convinced me to go there. And, and uh, I never will forget, I, I was debating between Prairie View and back then they called it East Texas State University, which is Texas A&M Commerce now, because back then <clears throat> Harvey Martin had just graduated uh, from uh, East Texas State and was drafted by the Cowboys. And so he and another friend of mine who I played with were trying to get me to go to East Texas. And so I went to visit them and I went and talked to people at Prairie View and chose Prairie View over uh, East Texas, uh, Texas a and Commerce. But anyway, but I, that was a great decision that I made because, uh, again, I was surrounded by professors who understood the challenges that we were going to be up against when we graduated. And they made sure, they went the extra mile to make sure that we were prepared. And they used to always tell us, we're going to make sure that you can compete with anyone. I don't care what college or university they attend. When you graduate from here, you'll be able to compete with anyone. And I mean, they pressed us, they worked us hard to make sure that we were ready. <laughs> now, is the education you received there at Prairie View uh, different from what you might have received elsewhere? No, not at all. Very, you know, uh, two plus two is four. I don't care where you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And uh, uh, but the thing about it is that I think the difference is is that we had professors who were failure was not an option for you. You know they would press you and uh, make sure you know, they would offer tutoring or whatever the case may be. Uh, failure was just not an option. Uh, as I said earlier, they knew what you were going to be up against when you graduated, and they made sure that that you were prepared. And I don't know if that would have happened anywhere else. Yeah. Now, have uh, any of your children attended uh, an HBCU? Yeah, my daughter uh, graduated from Texas Southern University, Marshawn Williams, and uh, uh, went to uh, law school, attended uh, law school, Thurgood Marshall, at uh, uh, Texas Southern also. How exciting. That uh, You must be very proud of that. Uh, you get to see many students you have taught, coached, and mentored. And you seem to light up with, with excitement whenever you're around them. I happen to be with you on a few of those occasions when you've met students that, uh, that, you've, that you've taught or coached. Uh, what is that like? Tell us, uh, tell us about that. What, what does it mean when you see students and you know that you, you might have impacted their lives in some, in some way? Well, you know, that, that, that's kind of interesting. It's, it's uh, rewarding. Um, it's priceless because when students see you and they come around you and they want to tell their supervisor at the job, this is my principal, uh, say different things about you. Uh, I never forget, uh, I, I would go out to eat at the restaurants and you know do different things. And my two, my two children, my son and my daughter, and my wife used to say, you know, we can't go anywhere without running into one of your former students, either South Oak Cliff, Carter, uh, uh, skyline and when they see you know they they be working there as a waiter or manager or whatever i don't care I mean, they're going to come oh mr williams you know and uh, uh and they're going to come and say hi you know and say different things and and you know that's rewarding and, and then let you know that you had a positive impact on their lives and a lot of times they would tell uh my wife about uh how strict i was and how i made them do right all the time you know but they appreciate it now Great. We celebrate Black History Month at DISD, as well as months that are set aside for other ethnic cultures, Hispanics, Asians, Native Americans, etc. Do we do enough, in your opinion, to recognize those that, that have come before us to pave the way in each of our cultures? I think that we can do more because I, I really believe, I have a firm belief that when young people really know their culture and their history, it has a tendency to build their self-esteem. And we have certain ethnic groups, whereas they make sure their students know their history. They have special classes for them on the weekends 
and uh, the students learn all about their history and uh, uh, great accomplishments that have been made, et cetera. And, and I think that that's so important. That's the reason why I press so hard for the African American Studies course and the, and the uh, Mexican American Studies course because our young people need to know about the accomplishments that have been made and, 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 let, and for them to know that you have potential and the sky's the limit for you. Uh, you've seen changes in the culture over the years, the changes in all cultures. Uh, what strikes you most about the changes that have taken place in our culture? Well, basically, we have a, a long way to go. You know, we have a, a long history, and and it's not all pleasant. But uh, you know, I believe, and you know, you must know your history because the people who the history are doomed to repeat it. And uh, uh, but you know, you can just stay in the past. You have to plan for the future. That's the reason why, you know, you heard excitement in my voice when I talked about these opportunities that their young people have with the choice schools, you know, career institute, magnet schools, the whole works. There's so many opportunities, you know. We have, you know, when I was working uh, on the school leadership side, I would attend the graduation ceremony, you know, I'd be one of the officials. And to see young people, graduate from high school with an associate degree from that uh, early college program. I mean, that is unbelievable. And so therefore, there's just so many opportunities for our young people now. And so, yeah, we've come a long way. Uh, you know, and then the district, I really applaud Dallas ISDs for our focus on racial equity and inclusion. I mean, in almost everything that we do in Dallas ISD. And we have uh, noticed that other school districts are learning from us and following our lead. You, you made that comment, and I want to go back to it again because you said it before. Uh, when I asked the question, "Why is Black History Month important to you?" and you, your quote was, "A people who forget their history are doomed to repeat it." Would you expound on that a bit? Yes, I, I think that you know you have to know your history, and uh, like I said. It's like a foundation. It's like building a house. Knowing your history is your foundation. You need a solid foundation, all right, to build on, right? And uh, I, I believe that when young people really know their history, I'm not talking about not just only uh, history here in the United States, but African history. You know, uh, I, I have a book that I used to always share with students, uh, the, the Destruction of the Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams which went all the way back to 4,500 BC and, and forward. And uh, uh, to learn so much about African history and uh, uh, not only that, but American history also, and we are a part of that. So when students learn all of that, it builds their self-esteem. I think they make better decisions and, and they, they, you know, like I said, they're prepared to become real successful members of our society. You asked uh, the question uh, earlier uh, when we were speaking, what would you like to share about Black History Month and uh, or your culture? And you made a comment, how bright our future is as a people. Can you speak to that, please? You know, when you look at, uh, you know, I, I kinda, I'm a news fanatic, I guess you would say. <laughs> uh, and I try to stay abreast of, uh, you know, international, national, state news. But I see so many young people that are making real good decisions, uh, that are, are excelling in so many areas in engineering and, and medicine. You know, uh, I, ha I have friends that, uh, that are, are doctors, engineers, attorneys, judges. I, I have a student uh, that's a judge now. And it's just, I see the progress that's being made, uh, not only here in Dallas ISD, but throughout the country. And, and uh, uh, like I said, so therefore a lot of progress is being made, even though the media doesn't really cover it that often. But uh, if you really kind of dig into it, you, you're, you're really kind of proud of the fact that so many young people are, are making progress and excelling in the various areas. Now you talked about your time uh, living in Dallas. Have you lived anywhere outside of Dallas? Now, born and raised, it's interesting. Born and raised <laughs> in Dallas, uh, 
that time that I was at Prairie View. And uh, as soon as I graduated from Prairie View, I did my student, they sent me up for dollars to do my student teaching. And uh, I was hired by Dr. Todd, my junior high school principal, because at that point he had become the principal at South Club High School. And uh, so I, he, I was scheduled, it was interesting, I was scheduled to do my student teaching at another school, but he had a connection with the guy who was over H, H what we call HCL, who was personnel back then. And they moved me uh, to do, they transferred me and they had, he had me to do my student teaching at South Oak Club. And then as soon as I finished, he hired me. So, uh, you know, I've been here in Dallas, and working in Dallas ISD. And, and trying to, and basically what I try to do is give back because it's a lot of people that uh, supported me, mentored me. And uh, I just, I've always said, you know, you've got to give back. And that's what I've tried to do. So what do you do outside of work? Well, outside of work, you know, I, I, I like working out. You know, people laugh at me because I have weights here in my office. Uh, I, I've always loved lifting weights. and. Uh, playing racquetball, et cetera. You know, things to kind of stay in shape. So that's basically what I do, you know, going out to eat and I like to travel. You, you talked about the Mandela uh, program at St. Luke. Tell us about the Mandela program. Yes, I'm one of the mentors. It's, it's called the Mandela program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mentoring program at my church for uh, middle school and high school uh, males. And uh, we work with them on, on the, uh, and you know, a lot of them are young men that, that don't have fathers in the home. And, and so therefore they're looking for mentors. So we're a mentors. Uh, we take them out on various outings, uh, teaching you like going out to go fishing, teach them how to fish. Uh, our plan is to take them uh, where, you know, to different experiences or whatever the case may be, and then bring in speakers to come in to talk with them. And, and, and we survey them to find out what is it that you want to do. So therefore, based on that, we make sure that we uh, take them to different events and do the things that they're asking for. And, and how often do you meet with the kids? Uh, every third Sunday. Wow. Wow, that sounds, that sounds really exciting. Do you follow your high school teams uh, you have coached over the years? I know you talked about your coaching experience quite a bit. Do you follow those teams with, uh, with the sporting events? Well, quite naturally, you know, I graduated from South Oak Club, taught at South Oak Club. And uh, when, <laughs> when I went back to teach, uh, the head football coach uh, uh, was my, uh, he was basically my high school football coach, uh, Norman Jett. And so he hired me to be a wide receiver coach uh, for the varsity when, uh, when I came back and started uh, teaching. And so I, I coached football at South Oak Cliff. And uh, so therefore, quite naturally, I follow South Oak Cliff. But, you know, any of the schools that are doing well, I follow uh, Duncanville because the coach, Reginald Samples, who's the head football coach at uh, Duncanville, he and I played together at South Oak Cliff High School. So I, you know, I support him by attending uh, Duncanville games and, and uh, yeah, any of the Dallas guys, because I love, you know, the basketball and, and my wife loves the, the girls basketball team. So we'll go to some of the girls basketball teams and games and, uh, and, and just love, love track. So we'll go to the Texas Relays for track and field. And so, you know, it's just, you know, I, I love sports, period. Yeah, I've been down to Texas Relays five or six years. My uh, my daughter competed when she was at Ursuline, so that is exciting. Um, now you you've had many positions uh, in in DISD. Anyone that stands out uh, stands out to you over those years with with all of the different functions you've been involved with? You know, it's amazing. I I don't know. It's just God you know, blessed me with a passion for children, and and I love working with children. So. Of all the positions, you know, um, classroom teacher and football coach, I, I enjoyed that uh, the most. So you were a principal of the year in, uh, in DISD in 2007. That was quite an honor. Was that while you were at Skyline? Yes, I was yeah, principal at Skyline High School and uh, I was voted principal of the year in Dallas ISD. 
Wow, that was quite a, quite an honor. Oftentimes, African American history is taught with the focus on the the biggest names from history, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and many others. But there are many African Americans like yourself who have played a vital role in the success of not only African Americans but all citizens and students and young adults. And we thank you for the sacrifices you have made in your many years with DISD. And as we close, uh, do you have any closing comments you'd like to add to this discussion? I just thank you all for this opportunity. And I think that uh, this is a part of people learning about Black history. And uh, um, it's just like I said, it's, it's, it's amazing what we have accomplished as a people from 1619 to now. Uh, if you really study the history, uh, it's just amazing what we've accomplished and after all the things we've gone through, but, uh, and to see so many young people achieving, excelling in, in the various areas, it's just, it's just amazing. It's a, a, a blessing from God. You and I have spent time together as we, uh, as we approach each other in the hallway and we talk about different things, and uh, I can feel the excitement when we talk about uh, what goes on in Dallas ISD and, and some of the things that you've been involved with. We certainly do appreciate everything that you've contributed to not only the Dallas Independent School District, but also to the city of Dallas and the, and the Dallas community. So we certainly appreciate that, and, and thank you for your time. Any other thoughts that you'd like to share? That's, that's it, and thank you, sir. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this back over to Stephanie Broughton. Stephanie? Thank you so much, Vernon. And such a great session, Mr. Williams. Um, please don't go too far because after we have our session with Annie, we're going to bring you and Annie back for a little panel conversation. So please just sit tight and join us again at the end at the conclusion of this session thank you guys so much for hanging in there with us again i am stephanie broughton moderator for the black history month facebook live series and now we're going to be talking with annie party annie is the director of the dallas isd mwbe department and we are so excited to have this conversation with annie annie thank you so much for joining us this afternoon my pleasure awesome so we are excited to have this conversation with you, and we want to make sure that we highlight a lot of the information about your life and kind of tell your story. And your story began in Louisiana. So tell us a little bit about, you know, being born in Louisiana, um, growing up in Louisiana. Talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Stephanie, definitely. Uh, first, before I tell about my upbringing in the great city of Tallulah, Louisiana, let me first and foremost say thanks to you, uh, Mr. Burning, as well as the Facebook Live audience for you taking time out of your schedule to hear a little bit about Annie Party. I grew up in the great city of Tallulah, Louisiana, small town, less than 10,000 people, I would say roughly about 8,000 people, but it was filled with a community of love and support. I had great teachers, wonderful parents, gifted educators and teachers who had a community where there was love and where we looked out for one another. There was a town where the black stayed on one side, the white stayed on the other side, but at the end of the day, it helped me to be a better person. So for that, I'm thankful to God for having raised me in that environment. Awesome. And you talked about briefly your parents. So let's kind of talk about your parents. Here's a picture of your mom and your dad. Yes. Uh, my beloved parents, uh, John Holmes Sr., who my brother was named after, and my beautiful mom, Hazel Lee Holmes, I am so thankful and I even have to give praises to God for blessing me with those parents. Uh, they were my role model. They encouraged me, they supported me, they protected me. And I could say probably one of the persons that gave me the greatest joy in life was my mother. I looked up to her, she was a, a beacon of light, just a shining example 
of what a mother should be. And I remember telling myself, if I can be just half of the parent or mother that she has been to me, then I'm gonna be all right. And one day she even told me, Stephanie, she said, you're a great mom. So I felt like, okay, Aww. I was doing a great job. Uh, but let me tell a little story that helped to shape my life with my mother. Uh, she was, uh, had to leave school at a very early age, around the eighth grade. Uh, she worked hard. She just loved her children. She gave us the best of what she had. She never, never, never uh, would do anything without including her children and putting us first. Uh, she had a PhD, not in education, not in textbooks. She had a PhD in love and she had a PhD in discipline. But my mother told us at an early age, do not bring any D's or F to this house or there will be consequences to pay. So Stephanie, in the third grade, what did I do? I made a D on my report card. So as I thought about with my mother, she actually practiced what she preached. If she said it, she meant it. So as I was uh, walking home with my older sister, one year older than me, I contemplated running away from home because I didn't want to face those consequences. So of course, my sister being one year and a little wiser, she convinced me to go home. So when I went into the house and I told my mother, showed her my report card, my sister standing back, afraid of what was about to happen. And of course, I could envision myself just trembling. My mother poured out her soul to me and she said, I am not just, you know, disciplining you for the fear of discipline. What I am doing for you is I want you to have a better life than what I've had. So then that's why she stressed the need for education. She didn't spank me that day, Stephanie. What she did was she told me that I want you to live a better life. I want you to have a quality education and education will open up the doors of opportunities. So when I looked in that, I said, you know, my mom is not unreasonable. She wants what's best for me. She had to work two and three jobs. One time I even remember four jobs to put food on the table, her and my dad, because my mom gave us many of our wants. My dad gave us many of our needs. So my mother would ensure that we had all of the extra because she poured out into us. So then I saw my mom just wanting us and putting such a value on education. So I said, you know, I want to make my mom proud. So then books became one of my focus because of that young story that happened to me in the third year. Well, I have to say that not only in the third year did your mom have an amazing impact on you, but I recall a conversation that you and I had about your mother. And I remember you saying that everything that you do, you think about your mother and you think about if this is the way that my mother would want me to be, if this is the way that my mother would want me to, um, you know, just handle things. And I remembered that and I thought, you know, just how much you admired your mother and how much of a huge impact she had on you, not only as a child, but as a woman. And so we're gonna kind of talk a little bit more about your mom later because I think she was extremely instrumental, both of your parents, of course. And, but like I said, I know that your mom, you had such a special relationship with your mom and we're gonna talk a little bit more about her later. Now, I know that your parents obviously had an impact on you, but you also had other influences throughout your life that people kind of helped you and you, know, you were under their wings. So let's talk a little bit about your mentor. Oh yes, my mentor, Miss Bessie Lee Cannon. She actually stayed around the corner from me. She was my Sunday school teacher and she was also a school teacher. I looked up to this phenomenal woman. She looked out for the, the children. She taught us biblical principles as well and how to lead a productive life. She introduced me to the Order of Eastern Star as well as public speaking and 
pursuing scholarship monies and things along those lines and how to work and serve in the church. Uh, I just had a lot of respect for her. And she had a lot of respect for me, I would say as well, because she took up time to kind of train me and mentor me and lead me. And she also had expectations. So I kind of thought in my mind, I did not want to disappoint her. So I tried to bring my A game to the table. And we would have things like Easter speeches. I didn't want to get up there and read. <laughs> I wanted to memorize my speech. And then she would call upon me and uh, have me to go to different churches and uh, do my speeches and things along those lines. So we had a phenomenal time growing up with Miss Cannon. Uh, there was also a teacher that I had, Mr. Eugene T. Milton. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a photo of him, mm -hmm. but I originally feared him. Uh, he was one of those teachers that he was hard. Mm -hmm. He told it like it was. He had all of the students uh, afraid of him. Mm -hmm. So when I was in the middle school, I was always kind of distant. But when I came to the senior high school, I guess I thought I was a little more polished at that particular point. I wasn't <laughs> going to be afraid of a teacher. So then we got to, we became closest friends and uh, confidants from a student teacher perspective. And I learned a lot from him about when you go to a class, don't sit in the back of a room, mm -hmm. learn a new word, vocabulary word every day. And in my mind, I pretty much said, if I could pass Mr. Milton's class, Mr. Uh, Milton's class, then I can pass in the class at the collegiate level or any because I had so much respect for you know him as well and his uh, his teaching skills and the demands that he had on his students and uh, before he passed along with uh, Miss Cannon whose uh, pictures you saw I had the opportunity to speak with them and to write them letters and provide them little gifts of love and things along those lines to let them know to give them their flowers while they were still there wow. and to say thank you for the the just putting things into me that were positive to help me a better to be a better person so I was pleased for that well you know Annie this the story that you just shared with us is a prime example of that old saying that it takes a village yes <laughs> <laughs> when you have not only your parents but you have mentors and teachers and and you know people around you that have such a huge impact on you that basically develops and, and, and shapes you into the woman you became, right? Yes. So all of those in, instrumental, um, you know, advice and support and love that you receive from these people, it shows. And so thank you so much for sharing that story. Now, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, your elementary school level, you know, getting that D. <laughs> Don't tell anybody stuff. Don't tell it. The I think the cat children. is out the bag now, Annie. So <laughs> but um so we so education was very important to your mother. Yes. And she definitely made sure that you took education seriously that you study and you did your homework and you came back with good grades with the exception of that one little time. <laughs> so as you went through school, you eventually, you know, went through all your lower level classes and then college came about and you had to make a huge decision. Okay, where am I going to go to college? What is college going to be like for me? Let's talk about that journey. Yes, well, it was an easy decision for me. Of course, many of you all may know that I attended the Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi, the uh, premier HBCU or the premier university uh, in the nation. But it was an easy decision. We had some of the counselors uh, from Jackson State University to attend our high school. And actually they had scholarships for students that were graduating uh, valedictorian and uh, salutatory in their classes. So then when I found that out and they even came to the school itself, it was an easy decision for me. Uh, in addition to that, my sister the year before had also attended uh, Jackson State University. Uh, so I was following in the footsteps of my sister uh, who I look up to and it, it was convenient for my parents to have both of us at the same university. 
and they were providing for us a scholarship to continue our education. And because of the income of my parents, even though my mom worked so many jobs as well, we still fell under a particular threshold where we could qualify for the Pell Grant. So with all of that uh, in, our, in my favor, then I attended Jackson State University and I'm so thankful uh, that I did. While attending Jackson State University, you know how you said they came and recruited, you know, you students say, hey, come to Jackson State University. We, what did you say, Any? We have the best university. <laughs> that is correct. And I want anyone from Prairie View to echo those sentiments. <laughs> so now, before we go further, I want to talk a little bit about Jackson State University because we didn't highlight that Jackson State is actually an HBCU. That so, is. yeah, so talk a little bit about HBCUs and what type of, because you said HBCUs provide the highest quality of education when other institutions did not. <laughs> well, I definitely don't do not want to frown upon any of the universities, but at this particular point, since I have the platform, I just want to promote Black excellence, if that's okay. Please so I do. would say <laughs> Jackson State University uh, with the HBCU culture, as Mr. Williams indicated earlier, it's all about a desire to help the students succeed, putting the students first. They also can empathize and walk in our footsteps. So then failure is not an option. Those professors and administrators, they go above and beyond to make sure we have access to a quality education and anything that we need to make us succeed. In addition to that, not just the textbook, they also give you lessons on life as well on how your character is so important, your responsibilities, uh, how it is so important that you get involved and engaged, build your, uh, build your resume, make sure that you have a professional uh, persona and presence, how to interview when you're going out to the job market. And when you get there, remember from where you came, so you always want to be in a position where you're trying to promote excellence. You want to be a good role model for other students that are following. And remember that you are a part of a HBCU where we support one another. So it's all about embodying community, embodying one another, promoting uh, the best, and just giving you a platform that you are destined to succeed. Yes, that sounds like an HBCU to me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Annie, for sharing that passion about not only higher education, but also HBCUs. Now, when you went to an HBCU, you were exposed to something that was amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the Divine Nine. Now, we're not going to share which part of the Divine Nine you are involved with. I, I think we can all guess, but let's just talk a little bit about the Divine Nine before we get into your particular participation. Yes, uh, Divine Nine is just an opportunity to provide excellence, like-minded individuals and organizations that have a desire to serve mankind and to help others. It's all about college educated young men and women that gives back, that supports, that mentors, that builds a legacy that can help others and us as a community to, uh, to succeed as well. So uh, you men, uh, indicated earlier that you were not going to uh, say which organization that I am a part of. So you many of you probably can tell by my attire that I am a member of the oldest and greatest sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. 
January the 15th, 1908, we have been over 100 years serving others. So I am a wonderful poet of the best, the oldest and greatest sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, also known as AKA. Well, you are definitely a proud member of this amazing sorority. And I want to highlight this particular sorority because I must say that over the years, your sorority has done some amazing work in the community, has donated, I mean, millions of dollars to help other students. And now we there's a documentary highlighting this amazing sorority called 20 Pearls. So I wanted to just share with everybody a brief clip of this particular documentary of 20 Pearls featuring AKA sorority. In 1908, nine young ladies, some of them were still teenagers, started Alpha Kappa Alpha. It would create a network for black women of like minds. Who thought of this in 1908? Can you imagine that? Alpha Kappa Alpha has done some impressive work across the years, from the Mississippi Health Project to the councils. It's not just a sorority in pink and green colors. I'm a fourth generation, AKA. I just think about the history. It's just the honor. It's a reminder that the legacy lives and lives for the generations to follow. It speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. So Annie, as you watched that documentary clip, what was going through your mind? Pride, resilience, mm -hmm. black excellence, strong, educated black women working together for a common good, serving and helping our communities. Yes. Pride. Yes, yes. I mean, as I was watching this and they pretty much echo what I said before I started playing the clip on the amazing work that the sorority has done over the years. And I'm not sure if it's matched by any others. So let's go ahead and share your pictures here. Oh, Walk yes. us through these, these pictures. Well, I'll be honored to and glad to, of course. On the left with the young ladies in the black, those are my line sisters. We grew together as a line. We were called the 30 illustrious illusions of alpha elegance. We went through the sorority uh, together. Uh, we learned, we grew together. And on the right, when we're in the green shirts, of course, that was at one of our homecomings at Jackson State University, where we all got together and we had some shirts and we had a marvelous time. I was number seven on the on the line as well. So during those particular times, it was very structured in the undergraduate environment. We had to line up from number one to number 30 because we had 30 on our line. And again, I was number seven. And today we we're still connected. We reach out to one another, not just at the homecoming. We would get together on some Sundays uh, virtually and just share, you know, with one another what we're doing. We celebrate our successes and our milestones. We're looking to get together to have a girls trip uh, where we just get together and have some fun and re reminisce what happens on that girls trip. We would stay on those girls trips. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but those are my line sisters and I love them dearly. They are more like blood sisters to me. We are very connected through the sorority. That's awesome. Now, Annie, we have talked about, you know, college, higher education, the importance of education. And I want to highlight 
the fact that for African Americans, none of this would have been able to, to be possible had it not been for those who came before us. So talk to me about, or share with me, if you will, your thoughts as it relates to those who came before us that even gave us the opportunity to even go to college because before Blacks, African-Americans, we were not allowed to go to college. We were not allowed to seek higher education. So share with me your thoughts on, on the history of that. Thank you for asking that uh, question, Stephanie. I appreciate it. You know, for this particular month, uh, Dallas ISD has embraced resilience. You know, even though we had been underutilized, downtrodden, mistreated, underrepresented, we fell down, but we got up. And through the resilience and the desire of a people that were full of passion and that were full of faith and that were full of God, there was nothing that could keep us down. So then we started educational institutions. We became doctors and lawyers and pastors and astronauts, et cetera, et cetera. It was all a means for those that were before us wanting to have a better future, not only for their immediate family, but for the entire community, for people that look like them, that had come through some of the same trials and tribulations. It was an ancestral opportunity to promote and to leave a legacy for others. So these institutions were started to provide education because education would open up the doors of opportunities. People perish because of a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge because of their culture, a lack of knowledge through wisdom and insights. So then when you provide a person with opportunities through education, then the doors are open. The vision is there. The opportunities are unlimited. So when you would see slaves and the uh, sons of slaves and the and the grandchildren of slaves, when they were put together what they had, if they didn't have any financial resources, they knew how to pray. And then those that had the financial resources would bring that. Those that had the education and expertise on how to build a university, they would do that. Those that could write, they would do that. And so with all of those people working together, utilizing the talents that God had given them, they created these institutions, these HBCUs, whether it was a one room school building through the phenomenal universities that we have today. It all started with a group of people or individual, it could have been a, just a mindset of one individual that wanted to make a difference that brought on like-minded people to help make a difference. So that's where we stood. We stood on the backs of some giants people that served others, mm -hmm. that put others before them. They were not concerned with the big I and the little you, but it was all about the we. How mm -hmm. can I make a difference to make someone else life better than mine? So that's what it was all about. People that were sacrificing, that were willing to help others. So I'm so glad the Lord made me black because I celebrate being an African-American woman because of the uniqueness mm. that, and the qualities that the Lord has given us. So I'm thankful. Yes. And Annie, you talked about the sharing of the sacrifices and all of those things, which brings me to Ms. McCarthy. Now, Ms. McCarthy, you know, we, we, this is almost kind of full circle at this point, Annie, right? So we, you know, we talked about the importance of higher education. We've talked a little bit about faith. We talked a little bit about prayer. We've talked a little bit about all these things. And I think Ms. McCarthy, she kind of just, I mean, embodies all of that in one. So do you want to go ahead and tell the viewers who she is and why she's so important to you? Uh, yes, because of her her love, her love for God, her, her love for education, her love for her people, her willingness yes. to sacrifice. Yes. She didn't have a lot of money, but right. what she had was a vision, and yes. what she had was a heart to serve, 
-hmm. and she would use her meager savings to put that money aside so that she can provide a scholarship or scholarships for other young African-American students. So who would say that this one person made such a difference and others began to provide monies similar to her just based mm -hmm. upon her story from yeah. Mississippi. Yeah. Willing to sacrifice of her financial resources to give back to others because she realized as my mother did, that education is so important right. you know, to the young people. So then she didn't have one, but she wanted to invest in others. So for that, I'm humbled to even know her and to be a part of her because of the work that she's done. And when I mean a part of her, I'm African-American that have been blessed by the Lord to be in a position to help others. And I see one thing that she has in that picture that we have in common. That's the Holy Bible. And with God, all things are possible. He will open doors that no man can close and he will close doors that no man can open. So when she had that seed planted in her heart mm -hmm. to provide scholarships for underserved African-Americans, then God gave her the increase. Yes, for sure. And it's so amazing that <clears throat> the type of work that she did, she said she had saved and saved and saved. And I have here, she saved $280,000 of which she donated $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi. I, I consider her Annie, the first, one of the first major pay it forward people, right? Because mm -hmm. she did that. And then, like you said, other people started joining for that. And, and one of the things that a quote from her is she said, it's not the ones that make the big money. <laughs> but the ones who know how to save, who get ahead. Mm -hmm. And she said her secret was contentment. You know, she was, she was happy with what she had. So that's how she was able to save this money and then donate it to help students attend college. And like you said, she didn't even attend college. And you know what, Annie, there is something about her that I'm not even sure if you're aware of or if you knew. She was born the same year that your sorority was formed. How about that? Well, I will make her an honorary. <laughs> okay. Well, there you have it. And that is definitely a little known fact about yeah. her. And when I saw that, I said, well, look at this correlation here. Wow. Step, now, let me share one thing too. When uh, sure. going back to my mother, Okay. Uh, my role model, my queen. When we were young and when we were born and probably while we were conceived, my mother started saving for our education. She started off by saving $5 per pay period and she would put into an account and she wouldn't touch it. And she just would let that money grow. And then you remember earlier, I told you how she would work three and four jobs so that we can have our wants met and my dad focus on the needs. Mm -hmm. So then she started that college fund for us with $5 per pay period, going into a bank and not touching it. And so I'm just can think of many, 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 many stories and sacrifices that my mom had made for her children. It's three of us my sister who's one year older and always been wiser and uh, my younger brother. And I think I'm smarter than him. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's great. Well, you know what, Annie? I kind of want to go back to something that you said that Miss McCarthy had that you were trying to, that you had mentioned a little bit and that was that holy Bible that she was holding. You mentioned, and I quote, African-Americans, as African-Americans, we have a rich tradition built upon faith, family, fellowship, and food. 
<laughs> can you talk about the uh, the importance of faith in your life? Yes, I would say faith is the foundation. That is the core. With God, all things are possible. I think that the Lord, and I know that the Lord is so important in my life. And I would say for the most part, African-American culture has embraced God as well. So faith is so important for me because I just believe that with God, all things are possible. I just believe when God is for you, no man can defeat you. I just believe that God would never leave me nor will he forsake me. And sometimes when I have self-doubt, and I do experience that sometimes, particularly when I'm planning for a big event, you know, such as this, why would Miss Stephanie allow little Annie to come in and be a part of such a wonderful Facebook Live series? I have to come to myself and I come to my senses and I think I'm a child of a king. I'm made in God's own image. God breathed life into me and I became a living soul. So when I think about that, whose I am and who I am, then I tend to get a little confident. And I know that Mr. Williams talked about sometimes when you look at other African-Americans and it helps you with your self-esteem when you see other people that are successful that look like you. So I began to think about those strong shoulders, you know, the things that our ancestors, you know, had to endure to at least provide me an opportunity to be working in this great Dallas ISD, the premier urban school district in this air conditioned building, sitting at in this beautiful you know, office. Someone paid the price for that. Someone paved the way for that. Someone paved an opportunity to ensure that there was racial equity and inclusion and diversity at all levels within you know, the organization, the environments and things along those lines. So faith made that possible. God made that you know, possible. So then uh, faith is so important to me and I'm not you know, saying everyone else, but I just know for me, that is the core of who I am, my faith and my belief in my God. Thank you so much for sharing that, Annie. And with all that, you know, like I said, you talked about faith, family, fellowship, and food. And at some point in your life, you were on the path of starting a family, getting married. So we want you to share with us that journey. <laughs> well, thank you. That is my debonair husband there, Mr. Anthony Partee Sr. We've been married almost 32 years. Like I like to laugh and have fun. I've been married 32 years to the same man and uh, he tolerates me. Uh, <laughs> so yes, that is my husband. We got married September the 28th, 1991. These young people that met at Jackson State University. And so that's Mr. Anthony Parchi Sr. We've grown together, picked up a little weight together. <laughs> For the most part, you know, like one another still. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so Annie, did you guys get married in, in Dallas or? No, that was my hometown church uh, in Louisiana it was called New Hope Missionary okay. Baptist Church. And walking distance from my house, I can just walk around the corner to the church. But of course, during that particular time, I rented me a, a limousine and I drove around oh. the corner to the church. Oh, fancy. You were getting fancy there with the with the limo. All right. So um, you and Mr. Party, you guys had a family. So let's talk about your family. Yes, we were blessed with uh, three children and four. Now we have four grandchildren. Uh, Santana is our oldest daughter. Uh, Anthony Sr., who's in the middle, is our oldest son. And then Antoine. Uh, Anthony and Antoine were both be getting married this year, one in March and one in May, because so you can imagine that there's a lot going on in the party house. But <laughs> my future daughters, they are phenomenal women. 
and I couldn't have chosen better brides for them. So I'm excited to what the future has and hold for these party men. And I hope they be as good of a husband to their wives as their dad has been to me. Oh, that's amazing. And so obviously, you know, this picture, they were young men on this picture. And now they're adults, they're getting married, they, they have families of, of their own. And so you, you mentioned their lovely brides to be and how phenomenal they are and how proud you are of the selection that they've made. So there's other things about these beautiful women that they've selected that you're proud of. Let's talk about the grandbabies. Oh, yes. Those are my pride and joy. If I could have had the grandchildren first, I may not have had children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are the love of my life. Now, I guess let me start with the oldest first. In the bottom right-hand corner, that is my lovely granddaughter, Skylin. Skylin is attending, as you see in the background, following her granddad and grandmother's footsteps, Jackson State University. She's on the uh, Dean's list, doing phenomenal. Uh, we just are so proud of her. And then the top is my little grandson, uh, my oldest grandson, that is Booker, Mr. Booker Rankin. He's a senior in high school at Hebron High School. And you know what's amazing about him? We get notes from time to time from his teachers. And the notes are saying what a positive young man he is and that he's just a great joy. And, you know, I'm just so proud to see a young man, a young African-American man, when they have been stigmatized by so many, you know, in the community uh, at large. But to get notes from his teacher to say that he's doing well, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And he's such a respectful, you know, young man uh, as well. Now let me come over here to my left. My two little youngest grandchildren, that is Mr. Xavier Ryan Partee and Miss Haven Ann Partee. They are my pride and joy. They keep us busy on our toes. They're always into something, learning new words and impressing us. And if you, if I didn't know any better, I would think they were the smartest children in the world. Uh, and they love their grandparents and, uh, and their grandparents love them. Uh, so this is a part of my extended family. You know, Stephanie, when I was a child, I used to pray because I always wanted to be a wife and a mother. So the Lord enabled me and blessed me to be both a wife and a mother. But I have double blessings now. Not only am I a wife and a mother, he's allowed me to see my grandchildren. So then I'm just thankful. That's another thing that I have to be thankful for. And as I think, I oftentimes begin to think. And what I mean by that is I think about the Lord and his blessings that he has bestowed upon me. I can't help but to think. And if I wasn't in Dallas ISD trying to be professional, I might just get up and do a shout. You know, in the African-American culture in the church, we, we, we shout. <laughs> we just give the glory and the honor to him. But I don't want to embarrass uh, Mr. Williams and Mr. Munnings, and I don't want Mr. Munnings laughing at me, you know, and things along those lines. So I'll kind of contain myself till I go off camera. Then go I for it, Annie. <laughs> then I get my praise on. Well, I guess I couldn't convince you and encourage you to do it because, you know, I I'm definitely would do that. Definitely. You will, Stephanie. <laughs> Well, why not? Why not? So Annie, oh my goodness, I think we we pretty much covered some amazing information about you and your family, your parents, your your mentors, Miss um, McCarthy. Is there anything else that you'd like for us to know before we move on to the panel discussion? Uh, just before we uh, get there, I just want to, you know, just kind of do a parallel. Uh, between the members of AKA sorority and the, the wonderful work that they do and a part of advocating for other people and the civil rights. And when you think of these, I'll just call three names. When you think of Kamala Harris and the work that she does, may I also mention Coretta Scott King and the work that she did. Let me also throw in there 
Ms. Rosa Parks and the, way, the work that she did. Those are all pillars in the political realm advocating for other minorities, women, and in particular, African-Americans. And I grow that parallel to think I'm in great company. The Lord has, bless, has blessed me to be in the MWBE department with Dallas ISD, not doing the same work as they did, but a similar work, advancing our people, African-American people and all people. And Stephanie, I would be remiss if I did not thank all of the wonderful team members that we have that are part of the MWBE department. We work together for a common good to ensure the inclusion of minority and women-owned companies in all aspects of the district's purchasing and contracting opportunities. I'm humbled to work with this phenomenal team of young ladies and young men uh, to work together to help. And one day, maybe someone will be talking about our legacy. Maybe we made a difference in the lives of a company or some individuals to put them in a position so that they can do the betterment of their society and give back, not only to their families, not only to their businesses, but to their communities. And we won't stop there, but to the world. So I'm thankful and I'm humbled and I'll be quiet for right now. <laughs> no, Annie, I love it. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for those powerful words. And I also want to go back a little bit, as you mentioned your sorority, I just want to let everyone know, for those of you who are interested in viewing the 20 Pearls, it's available on Amazon Prime. So definitely go make sure you go ahead and check, check out that documentary so that you can learn more about that amazing sorority. Annie, I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk thank with you. us today and share your story with us today. It's definitely an amazing story. Um, and we just appreciate you for definitely sharing and being transparent. And I want to go ahead and take this opportunity to welcome back Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, are you still with us? Oh, there you are. <laughs> thank you so much for hanging in there with us. And now we're just going to kind of talk about, we're going to talk with you and Annie about your roles here with Dallas ISD. Annie had already mentioned that, you know, with our particular department, how we help minority owned and women owned businesses. And I also want to highlight that Mr. Williams is a deputy chief here at Dallas ISD with special projects, as well as the MWB department. So the first question I want to ask you guys in, in connection to Annie's closing, how important is the work that each of you do as it relates to creating and expanding business opportunities for minority owned and women owned businesses? Mr. Williams, we'll go with you first. I think it's uh, very important for uh, the Dallas ISD's MWBE department. Like I said, this is just my third year working with them. And I'm just, every day, I'm just amazed at the work that they do and the impact that they're having on minority and women-owned businesses. And uh, uh, the major impact that they're having is they're giving them opportunities to uh, be a part of, like Ms. Parti has said, purchasing and contracting activities in Dallas ISD. Uh, and, and when that happens, when they're able to bid for contracts with the district, and win those contracts, it has an impact not only on that business, the owner, but he or she is able to hire more people, uh, increase the staff. And then when that happens, we're having an impact on those families. You know, they're maybe able to pay more to the staff. And so you impact your families. And when you impact the families, then you impact the community. They can do things within their communities. So, uh, you know, that, that's that's the amazing thing to me is the, uh, you know, being able to support these businesses and through, uh, you know, the, the, you know, what you actually lead, the training, the webinars, to build capacity of these contractors and vendors and uh, what Mr. Munnings does 
uh, in reference to being that bonding is a major issue with companies. And I didn't know anything about that prior to uh, joining this team, but bonding is a major issue. The reason why a lot of the uh, companies are not able to bid for contracts because they don't have the bonding capacity. And for our department to get together and have bonding academies to prepare them so that they can you know, receive these bonds bid and win contracts with Dallas ISD or wherever they, uh, you know, if it's with the city of Dallas, the county or whatever the case may be. So, you know, you're helping these businesses and uh, I, that's, you know, to me, that that's that's great work. And uh, so therefore, that, that's the main thing as far as I'm concerned, uh, being able to be an asset to these companies. All right, well, speaking of bonding capacity, I was going to share this at the end, but it seems the appropriate time now. We're actually going to have Calvin Stevens join us on Friday. And he is, of course, part of the Bond Academy. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. So I just wanted to highlight that since you mentioned our Bond Academy. And so, Annie, I want to go back to you and I'll, ask, and I'll re ask the question. So, how important is the work that each of you do as it relates to creating and expanding business opportunities for minority owned and women owned businesses? Great question, Stephanie. I would sum it up with this acronym VIP. And that VIP stands for, it is a very important program. As we look at a term called the have and the have not. So I'm not talking about the Tyler Perry TV show. Sometimes when you're looking at it from an economical perspective, those that have tends to want more and they're not considerate of those that have not or do not have as much. They're not like Ms. Osiolo who was content in what they have. So that if they tend to want more, they are not going to be as willing to share with others. So this program provides an opportunity to help level that playing field by encouraging everyone to be fair, to promote racial equity as well as in conclusion. Because at the end of the day, everyone's going to have an opportunity uh, to grow, to feed and support their families, to help in their communities. And when there are biases that may or may not exist, these type of programs help to navigate that. We help to level that playing field and ensure that everyone is given an opportunity to compete fairly for business opportunities. And when you see many of the MWBEs that I deal with and have uh, come to know, they are just as competitive just as competent. They're fast, they're friendly, they're flexible, they give you good pricing, good products. You're able to meet directly with the owners of the companies as well. So it's very important. And I, it, it makes me think of a story years ago. Uh, there was a company that told us she was on her sick bed, but Dallas ISD gave her an opportunity and she was able to work with Dallas ISD while on her sick bed and her continued, her company continued to grow. So that's what we wanna do, provide opportunities for people, whether you're on your sick bed or you're making millions of dollars to impact so that they're given the opportunity to compete mm -hmm. and be uh, responsible citizens and to give back to others and to help others. That's what we're all about. We just want fairness and equity. We don't want it all. We don't expect 100% MWB participation, but I would love to try to get 99% if I could, but I'm uh, just, just kidding, just kidding. A little bit. Just kidding. <laughs> so Andy, you said just as, I, when you said that phrase, I kind of want to dig into that because that means that there's a reason why you emphasize that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people think if they have bought into this false, this falsity that bigger is better. Mm -hmm. If a company is larger, they have an international presence or they have a lot of income, uh, they're able to do all the commercials and things along those lines. They have PR 
behind them that they have a better product service. Like Mr. Williams say, two plus two equals four. You know, <laughs> just give the companies an opportunity and they could be a billion dollar industry if they are given an opportunity, you know, to get there. Mm -hmm. So we want our companies to grow and succeed. And it could start with that one person right. that's willing to give them an opportunity. So when others see that they're doing a phenomenal job, someone else will be willing to open their door. And within our MWB department, our goal is to spend 99.959% <laughs> of our dollars with minority and women-owned companies because we've seen the fruits of their labor. Mm -hmm. So we practice what we preach. So we do our best to ensure that minority and women are utilized within Dallas ISD. Trying yes. to get everyone else there. Yes. We will. Yes. yes. And I know that within the district, we do have MWBE goals, albeit they're not the 99% that we would hope for, but, but comparative, they're pretty high. I mean, our goals are 30 and 35%. And I, and I think they're pretty high compared to other entities within the DFW area and, and pretty much throughout the state, especially as it relates to independent school districts. And I want to ask both of you, I guess we can pretty much have this conversation as it relates to these particular goals that we have within our district. The board of trustees had a lot to do with that. Do you guys wanna talk a little bit about the support that our particular department receives from the board of trustees, as well as the superintendent here at Dallas ISD? Certainly, uh, Stephanie, I'll be happy to share. Uh, and if I'm talking too much, please just uh, give me a little virtual tap. <laughs> and I kind of be quiet a little bit. Uh, but I am so fortunate to work with the uh, board of trustees and general superintendent and executive leadership that believes in racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's a top-down approach to ensuring that minority and women are utilized. They had such a vision or passion for this that we are outlined and supported through the board policy CH local. In addition to that, they have us as an independent, self control managed department that focuses on MWBE utilization and advocacy. We work in, in conjunction and in synergy with other departments, but that's our primary mission is to work with minority and women owned companies. So you can't get much better support than that. Uh, just listen to a board meeting to see them address MWB and speak so eloquently and passionately and empathetically when it talks to MWBE and knowledgeable regarding MWBE. Can't get much better than that. I'll be quiet and let Mr. William talk uh, regarding that. <laughs> no, it's just I, I agree uh, with you, Ms. Parti. And, you know, we receive a lot of support from our trustees. And uh, we have one trustee, uh, Dr. Joyce Foreman, who has a procurement background and she owns a business. So she knows what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so therefore she makes sure, you know, she, um, and she pays attention to the reports that we submit on a quarterly basis. And, uh, but she's very supportive. I mean, it was uh, amazing to the entire team. Uh, I don't think that Dr. Elizalda had been in the district more than maybe two to three weeks, and she attended an event, and she came and she talked about MWBE, and, and you know, for the superintendent to talk about, you know, your department, and, and she, you know, complimented us on some things that she had heard about already from some of the uh, contracting uh, associations about the work that we're doing or whatever. So, you know, that, that was, uh, that was really good to hear that from her. But, but I know who I've worked with her before and I, I knew that she would support uh, the MWBE. So, uh, you know, like I said, to, to get to have the support of your trustees, your nine trustees and uh, your superintendent. And then you have people within the district uh, of various chiefs like Dwayne Thompson, who's the chief business uh, officer for the district. And uh, and then his support. I mean, we've gone to him, and he's been very supportive of various issues, uh, along with Brent Alford, who's the chief of uh, 
uh, construction services and uh, for, to support. And then we, as Ms. Partee has mentioned, we work with uh, uh, the maintenance department, David Bates, uh, another person who's very supportive with us and the procurement department, Chris Robinson. So it takes all of us working together you know, to support uh, these minority and women-owned businesses. And then we have uh, a MWB advisory uh, council, and we have strategic partners who come in, who are experts, have, uh, as Ms. Partee says, subject matter experts, and they'll come and make suggestions, recommendations uh, you know, to us based on their level of expertise in various areas. So like I said, it's all of us working together to impact minority and women-owned businesses uh, and uh, not only Dallas, but in the Metroplex. Yes. And actually, you know, we we are a little humble as a department, but yes, we are, of course. <laughs> we are an award-winning department. Not only are we an award-winning department, we also have individual team members who have won awards over the years. And this question is directed to Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, you have proudly indicated that you want the Minority Women Business Enterprise Department here at the district to be the gold standard. Let's talk a little bit about your feelings and your thoughts about the being the gold standard and why that's so important. Uh, you know, the people who, who know me, Leslie Williams, uh, from being a football coach to uh, security specialist in the district to uh, a principal, uh, you know, all the positions I've had. Everyone knows that, that uh, Mr. Williams has a problem with second place, right? And that's just in every position I've, I've had throughout my, you know, my career. Uh, and I've been blessed to go after that. And uh, so therefore, when I became a member of this team, and I, I saw the talent that we have, I mean, I've worked with a lot of different departments in my career over 40 years. And this is one of the most talented teams I've ever seen or been able to work with. And, uh, and I just saw that talent. I said, you know what, if we will be, and I saw the work that had been done prior to me coming and uh, or joining the team. And I just said, basically, we will be the gold standard not only for the city of Dallas, but for the nation, because we need strong MWBE programs throughout the United States, period. Not just Dallas ISD. We need people to focus on supporting minority and women-owned businesses throughout the entire country, not just Dallas. So therefore, I think that you know, we'll, we will become the gold standard so that people can call and come visit us and we can share our best practices and strategies with them so that uh, they can achieve. Awesome. And so between you and Annie, you both have a combined of over 60 years of Dallas ISD experience and being within the district. And eventually you guys are gonna retire and some of us, some of you guys are gonna retire again, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> What is what would you like to see happen? You know, I know Annie said, hey, she wants 99.58% MWBE utilization here within the district. But before you retire, before you, you know, end your chapter with Dallas ISD, what would you like to see with the MWBE department and the collaborations that the MWBE department has throughout the district? Annie, we'll start with you. Great question, thought provoking question. So let me see if I can address it. What would I like to see? I believe that I would like to see, be able to pass the torch, to pass the torch to someone that has a passion and a heart for helping others and for serving others. Someone that I could say that is a servant leader. And I think if we put the program in the hands of the right person with the right motive and the right mindset, the rest will follow. 
I think we, have throughout the years, have established a pretty reputable foundation, a person that would come on and once I pass that torch, someone that is going to go in and use their own creativity, their own insights and wisdom and intellect, and the vision that is given to them to move the program in their direction for the next level of success. I was only here for a point in time. The Lord appointed me for a particular time. But someone is out there that is going to take it to the next level under their vision. So if I can pass the torch to someone with a like-minded that is willing to help others and have that mindset, then I've left a legacy. Uh, I've had a lot of people that I have been mentored by that has passed the torch to me. I think of like Tommy Lyle and Dio Prasad, those wonderful trailblazers in the department. They believed in me and I think they felt comfortable leaving the program in my hands. So when I'm able to pass it, and we have many on our MWBE team that would be really ready, willing, able, and they are qualified and competent to do the job. So just turn it over to them without any reservations or hesitations and let them do the work and move it forward. And that's success in my, in my you know, vantage point. Thank you so much, Annie, for sharing that. Okay, Mr. Williams. Basically, I, I would like for the other entities in the, um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Metroplex, to uh, follow some of the things that we're doing in the MWBE. And uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the city of Dallas, Dallas Housing Authority, uh, the county, et cetera. And in reference to working extremely hard to increase the utilization of minority and women-owned businesses. And for the community at large to support that. And, uh, and that's the main thing is that to be able to as Ms. Partee mentioned, level the playing field uh, for minority and women-owned businesses. And uh, uh, like I said earlier, which will have an impact on their families and their communities. So that's my focus. And, and I agree with Ms. Partee, is preparing the, the next generation, next gen, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> a, a, a group to take my place and uh, uh, Ms. Partee's place. And where I think we're, Ms. Partee's doing a real good job uh, building capacity. Uh, she requires every member of the team to, to not be satisfied with the status quo, to go out and get additional training and certifications and, and, and MWBE related areas, right? Building their capacity so that one day they can take Ms. Partee in my place. And, uh, uh, and you know, we can pass the baton and they can do bit greater things than what, what Ms. Partee has done so far. So that, that's the main thing is that if, if this focus and this, this energy and passion could spread throughout the Metroplex, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and, uh, um, you know, the, our politicians, uh, the, the businesses or whatever can focus on increasing the utilization of minority and women-owned businesses throughout the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Awesome. So, Mr. Williams, you mentioned the younger generation. I have one last question for you guys. What words of wisdom would you like to share with the younger generation since you mentioned the younger generation? generation. So, Let's talk about the words of wisdom. So Annie, we'll start with you on this one. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. You know, I think and reflect upon my high school motto. It was, I do not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And that just, you know, is my pillar. I can't change tomorrow, I can't change the past, but I do know and serve a God that knows the future. And I would also tell them, if you believe it, then you can achieve it. 
expect greatness and don't settle for the status quo. Equip yourself with like-minded people that are going in the same direction. Believe in you and the talents that God has put in you and the vision that he has given you. Don't give up. And like the district's Black history motto, motto just be resilient. Believe in yourself and you can do it. Thank you so much, Annie. Mr. Williams. Yeah, I'll just repeat something that I used to tell my students when I was a uh, classroom teacher and, you know, and as a principal. I would always let them know that they have so much potential. And, and, it's, and it would frustrate me so much that the establishment knows the potential that they have. But our young people have to really believe in themselves and believe that they can achieve whatever goals they set. But then the second part of that, they must be willing to put the work in. You know, you know they admire these athletes, you know, LeBron James and uh, Steph Curry and all those, uh, Michael Jordan. But if you sit down and you listen to those guys, they'll tell you about the hard work, the extra hours, that they put in when their friends were out socializing, having a good time, that they were in there working on their shots, working on their basic fundamentals. They were working, they did the extra work, right? And uh, um, so therefore they have to understand, you have to make, be committed and say, no one's gonna outwork me. And I do have the potential to achieve anything that I want to, as long as I'm willing to put in the work. And that's the bottom line. Well, those are definitely great words of wisdom from the two of you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I am not sure if Vernon is still with us. So Vernon, if you're still with us, if you don't mind to turn your camera on. So I want to thank both of you so very much for sharing with us today. I also want to thank Vernon Mullen for um, his assistance with moderating today. Thank you so much, Vernon. Um, this has been such an amazing session, and I just want to thank you guys again. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, for watching us today, and please continue to um, share with your friends. Like us on social media. We're on social media. Like us on social media. Attend some of our other webinars and trainings that we have coming up that you can find out on our, on our website. And before we leave, I also just want to highlight again that we will have another session on Friday, uh, February the 17th at 1130 featuring Calvin Stevens. So I hope you guys join us for that particular session. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams, for joining us and sharing your stories with us today. And we want to thank you guys so much for watching. And we hope you have an amazing day. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.